Today we are gonna talk about the most famous axiom in math and how it literally saved math from self-destruction. So stick around. In 1901, the famous philosopher and mathematician Bertrand Russell discovered the now called Russell Paradox. I'm going to explain it to you, but if you want, you can check my previous video in the series where I give a crazy explanation of this same paradox. Russell's paradox goes like this. Consider the set R whose elements are all the sets that do not have themselves as elements of themselves. In other words, R is the set of all the sets that do not behave in a strange way by having themselves as elements of themselves. We now have axiom 2 that forbids for a set to be an element of itself, but that doesn't prevent us from defining R the way we did. Russell, who was a genius in logic from a young age, discovered a major, major flaw in the set R. Because, look, there are two possibilities. Either R belongs to itself or R does not belong to itself. If R is not an element of R, then according to the definition of R, R should belong to R because in R we put exactly those sets that do not belong to themselves. But on the other hand, if R does belong to R, then R should not belong to R because in R we don't want any set that belongs to itself. So let's recap. R belongs to R if and only if. R does not belong to R, and this is clearly contradictory and paradoxical. And you might think that this is a minor issue and that nobody cares about the set R, but this is actually a major problem for all math, and I'll show you why. If you are able to prove that something is true and that the contrary is also true, then math has no meaning and no value, because from there you can prove whatever you want, and I'll show you how. So, assume for example that you proved that all lemons are yellow, and you also proved that not all lemons are yellow, and you want to prove from there that 1 is equal to 2. I'll show you how to do that. Consider the proposition 1 is equal to 2, or all lemons are yellow. Since the second part of the OR is true, then all the proposition must be true. Now, pair this proposition with the proposition not all lemons are yellow. Since the first proposition is true, but not all lemons are yellow, we deduce that 1 must be equal to 2, because there's no other way for the first proposition to be true, because not all lemons are yellow. And of course you can substitute 1 is equal to 2 with whatever you want, and this is a famous principle of logic, and it is called with a Latin name ex falso quadlibet, that means from falsehood, whatever you like. So, if you have Russell's paradox, you can prove whatever you want, and math has no meaning at all. So, I'm gonna show you how mathematicians solved the situation, but before that, I'm gonna tell you about the Barber's paradox, which is somewhat similar to Russell's paradox, and is gonna help us understand the solution for this situation. So, the barber's paradox goes like this. There is a town with a barber that shaves those men and only those who do not shave by themselves. Does the barber shave himself? Any answer to this question results in a contradiction. The barber cannot shave himself, as he only shaves those who do not shave by themselves. And if the barber does not shave himself, according to the rule, he must shave himself. But there's a solution, and can you spot it? And here's the solution. The barber is a woman, or a gorilla, or a kid, or a robot, whatever you want, as long as he's not a man. Fifteen cents, please. So, mathematicians thought for a whole while on how to solve Russell's paradox, how to solve this dire situation of math, and they came to the conclusion that the set R is not actually a set. You cannot expect to throw things in a container and build a set like that. Not everything is a set. So, how do we know when something is a set and when something is not? I'm going to explain it to you first in an informal way, and then I'm gonna give you the precise statement of axiom 3. 
if A is a set, the elements of A that satisfy a given property do actually give rise to a new set, actually a subset of A. And this is what you can do. If you have a set, you can select the elements that satisfy a given property. So let's make some examples. Let's say we have the set N of natural numbers that we are going to define actually later on in this series. And we want to define the set E whose elements are the elements of N that are even. This is a set according to axiom 3. Let's say you have the set R2 of couples of real numbers and you want to define the set P whose elements are the elements x, y in R2 with y greater than 0. This is a set according to axiom 3. So let's state axiom 3 which is called the axiom of specification. Let's state it formally. If phi of x is a formula that takes true or false values depending on x, then for every set A, there exists a set B such that for every element X, X belongs to B if and only if X belongs to A and phi of X is true. In other words, if A is a set, the container B, whose elements are the elements of A that satisfy phi, is actually a set. To be precise, this is a schema of axioms and not just a single axiom because there is one axiom for every formula phi. So what was the problem with the set R in Russell's paradox? The problem was that the elements of R are chosen in the universe, they are not chosen from another set and this is not allowed, at least not in modern mathematics. So this axiom greatly restricts the possibility to build new sets, so mathematicians were forced to add new axioms to build more sets, and we're gonna see axioms 4, 5 and 6 all together in the next video. One last question. Suppose, Lord Russell, this film were to be looked at by our descendants, like a Dead Sea Scroll in a thousand years' time. What would you think it's worth telling that generation about the life you've lived and the lessons you've learned from it? I should like to say two things, one intellectual and one moral. The intellectual thing I should want to say to them is this. When you are studying any matter or considering any philosophy, ask yourself only what are the facts and what is the truth that the facts bear out. Never let yourself be diverted either by what you would wish to believe or by what you think would have beneficent social effects if it were believed. But look only and solely at what are the facts. That is the intellectual thing that I should wish to say. The moral thing I should wish to say to them is very simple. I should say, love is wise Hatred is foolish. In this world, which is getting more and more closely interconnected, we have to learn to tolerate each other. We have to learn to put up with the fact that some people say things that we don't like. We can only live together in that way. Cheers, bye.